everybody. So our next speaker is Lindsay Brown. Lindsay has a strong interest in water quality and understanding environmental pollution and how it can be remediated to protect and conserve ecosystems. She's canoed her way through the lakes of Minnesota collecting water samples and has enjoyed getting to snorkel with the resident sea turtles during her time here in La Jolla. The name of Lindsay's presentation is Mercury in Motion, Management and Testing Recommendations for the Disposal of Dredge Sediment from the Bay to the Ocean. Thanks, Samantha. This footage is of a ship dumping nuclear waste barrels straight into the ocean. It was thought back then that the ocean would dilute the nuclear waste and reduce the negative impacts on the environment. Before laws were enacted to regulate ocean dumping, the ocean was essentially used as a trash can where chemical, industrial, radioactive, and sewage waste were disposed. After decades of uncontrolled dumping, intense environmental impacts were noticed. In 1972, however, Congress enacted the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act to regulate the dumping of all materials into the ocean that would adversely affect human health, the marine environment, and ecological systems. My project is focused specifically on sediment dredging and dumping into the open ocean. Sediments are carried down through rivers and streams to the end of the watershed, where they can accumulate, causing issues for barges, military vessels, and larger ships. Bays, harbors, and marinas need to be dredged routinely to maintain navigational depths for ships to be able to pass through. This process involves clawing to remove sediments from the bottom of the channel into a barge where it's either transported to an ocean disposal site, used for beach nourishment, or disposed through a landfill. The EPA manages around 98 ocean disposal sites in the country's federal waters, which are shown on the map in red. These sites are used for the disposal of non-toxic sediments that are routinely removed from the mouths of rivers and channels to maintain navigational depths in ports, harbors, and marinas. For sediments to be approved for ocean disposal at one of these disposal sites, they need to go through a series of tests and analyses that need to meet certain thresholds determined by the Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. But as time goes on, more research is done. We tend to scoff and think how obvious it is not to dump radioactive waste barrels into the ocean, for example, but our current systems in place need to be constantly updated as well to keep up with current science to fully protect environmental and human health. More and more research is being done on the impacts of these chemicals of major public health concern. That's where my project comes in to compile research, to fill in knowledge gaps, and provide recommendations for additional analyses and requirements for sediment disposal specifically for mercury contamination in the sediments. My project specifically is focused focus on a dredging project in Newport Bay in the city of Newport Beach, California. Most of the maritime commerce, commercial fisheries, and recreational boating occurs in the lower bay, while the upper bay contains varying levels of de development and an ecological reserve in the northern portion. Due to the agricultural and industrial activity in the watershed, there have been long-standing issues of sediment contamination in Newport Bay, including mercury. Mercury is a chemical element that can impact the neurological, cardiovascular, and endocrine system. Mercury pollution is present all over the world's oceans, estuaries, and freshwater bodies. It contaminates fish and other seafoods that are important sources of protein and nutrition for people worldwide. Despite some improvements in mercury pollution, levels in commonly consumed marine fish, such as bluefin tuna, frequently exceed human health guidelines, causing recommendations to limit weekly fish consumption. But where does this mercury come from and how does it get into the sediments? Mercury is naturally emitted from volcanoes and wildfires. However, humans have introduced much more mercury into the air through fuel combustion and mining. Once mercury is in the air, it binds to particles where it settles onto land and into water, such as lakes, streams, and oceans. Once in the water, specialized bacteria can convert it to its more toxic form in the water column and the sediments. Once mercury is in its toxic form, it can accumulate in individual organisms and also transfer up the food web to the fish that we eat. The US Army Corps of Engineers, in partnership with the city of Newport Beach, 
is planning to dredge in Newport Bay later this year. Before dredging can occur, the Army Corps of Engineers and the city must complete toxicity tests that determine impacts of contaminants in the sediments to organisms. Most of the sediment was considered acceptable for ocean disposal based on these analyses. Around 933 cubic yards of sediment are suitable for ocean disposal at the EPA's LA-3 ocean disposal site. This is around 1,600 average-sized homes worth of sediment being dumped up at the LA-3 site, where the current mercury levels at the site are low to non-detect, and the effects of disposing of this much sediment that is loaded with mercury is unknown. The current testing manual used to determine if sediments from dredge sites are approved for ocean disposal is called the Evaluation of Dredge Material Proposed for Ocean Disposal Testing Manual, otherwise known as the Green Book. Sediments proposed for ocean disposal must first be characterized and undergo a series of acute and chronic toxicity bioassays. To do this, the Green Book has a four-tiered testing approach. If tier one does not meet the thresholds defined, then additional data must be compiled from tiers further down the triangle. These tiers use effects-based testing to show that sediments do not pose an environmental or human health risk. The effects-based testing is intended to assess the effects of multiple contaminants on multiple different indicator organisms, such as the ones shown here, that are exposed to sediments of the dredging project site. These sediments consider multiple exposure pathways, including short-term exposure through the water column and long-term exposure in the benthic environment to see what impacts occur to the organisms. During the dredging process, the sediment is disturbed, and some of this toxic mercury can get into the local water of the area and impact organisms. This is why sediments must be tested and analyzed before dredging occurs to assess its toxicity. Once the sediments pass toxicity tests, the sediments can be disposed and released from a barge into an ocean disposal site. There should only be short-term and localized water quality impacts from the transfer of sediments through the water column. However, because there is so much sediment that needs to be disposed of through the Newport Bay project, this could increase the mercury at the disposal site by as much as 43%. This, in turn, impacts the amount of toxic mercury that is present as well, posing a potential risk to organisms in the area of the disposal site. Knowing how mercury is transformed to its more toxic form and what factors influence that transformation can provide important information for the potential impacts of this sediment input. The toxic form of mercury is called monomethylmercury. Understanding the processes by which mercury is transformed to its more toxic form can provide additional information of what may happen to the sediments when disposed at the LA-3 site. Monomethylmercury is only 1 to 10 percent of the total mercury. However, this percentage is very important due to its impacts on organisms. Mercury can be converted to monomethylmercury biotically in the environment through the addition of a methyl group. This process is known as methylation. There are many factors that can impact mercury methylation. The concentration of mercury and its bioavailability is a key component. Bioavailability in this context means that the mercury is able to be taken up by the microbe to be transformed to its toxic form. Mercury must be able to cross the inner and outer membranes of methylating bacteria in order to be transformed to monomethylmercury. Sulfide and dissolved organic matter influences this production because it can bind to mercury and impact its ability to cross the cell membrane. Neutral, uncharged, small, and soluble compounds could be taken up through passive diffusion by methylating microbes. However, when larger charged species are dominant, such as when sulfide levels are high, they are less likely to cross the cell membrane and therefore cannot be methylated. These factors are important to consider when recommending additional analyses in the sediments of the dredge site and the disposal site. Monomethylmercury is able to be absorbed into the tissues of animals and accumulate over the course of its lifetime. This is known as bioaccumulation. If the organism is consumed by organisms further up on the food web, the monomethylmercury can be transferred to the predator organism, known as biomagnification. The quantity of accumulated mercury in aquatic organisms is affected by its level in the food web, or the higher the organism's level in the food web, the more mercury is accumulated. 
And generally, the older the organism, the more mercury, mercury is accumulated as well. When taking into account mercury methylation factors and its environmental impacts, I made additional recommendations for sampling and analyses at the dredge and disposal site. And I will only be touching on a couple in, these, in this presentation. At the dredge site location, testing for all forms of mercury can assist with the understanding of what is present in the sediments and what may occur when disposed at an ocean disposal site. Currently, only total mercury is tested for in the sediments, but testing for all forms could give a more accurate sense of how much monomethyl mercury is present. Along with testing for all forms of mercury, dissolved and sedimentary sulfur compounds should also be tested, since mercury can bind to these charged sulfur compounds, impacting its bioavailability to methylating bacteria. Sulfur compounds are not usually analyzed and tested for in the sediments and water column, but knowing these levels locally and at the LA3 site can assist with modeling efforts as well. These recommendations would be considered through Tier 4 testing of the Green Book. Tier 4 testing is rarely used and only on a case-by-case -case basis, but with the concern of the additional mercury to the disposal site, these recommendations should be used in addition to the current testing. Additional chemical monitoring at the ocean disposal site for sediment contaminants can provide a greater understanding of what may be going on at the site over time. Currently, monitoring of the LA3 site involves assessing sediment and physical characteristics of the site, as well as looking at the benthic environment. It would be useful to have some chemistry parameters for additional understanding. Another recommendation to protect organisms is to avoid dredging and dumping in periods when seasonal methylation rates are high. This is currently between May through September in the Northern Pacific Ocean. Also avoiding dredging and disposal while sensitive species may be migrating and spawning is another important aspect to consider to minimize environmental impact. These recommendations can further the understanding of how trace metal cycling happens in the marine environment and assist with modeling efforts to provide knowledge of what will happen when the future sediments are disposed of at the LA3 site. And of course, mercury is not the only chemical of concern in these sediments. There's persistent organic pollutants that can also bioaccumulate, such as PCBs and DDT. I attended a DDT conference last month at UC Santa Barbara that revolved around the DDT dump site recently discovered off the coast of Los Angeles. This, this image shows a barrel that is part of that dump site and was disposed of before regulations were in place. I learned a lot about the different impacts and potential solutions through, through this conference, but, with, but what really stuck with me was the workshop on the last day. There were people from different federal and local agencies, scientists from environmental and human health backgrounds, and non-governmental organizations coming together to build a framework to increase understanding and provide solutions to this issue. That experience emphasized for me the importance of different sectors working together to come up with solutions to complex issues for effective progress. Moving forward, taking these recommendations to better understand mercury contamination and implementing them with the assistance of collaborative dredging management teams needs to be prioritized in order to protect the health of our environment and the people depending on it. I would like to give special thanks to my Capstone Advisory Committee Alan Oda, Amina Shartup, and Katie Day for their assistance this quarter. I would also like to thank my friends, family, and other support for over this year and to this program for giving me the ability to do this work. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, I was wondering if that you know of, if there are alternatives for dumping sediments into the ocean. Like, is there a way to use plants or other ways to bioremediate that? Or is this pretty much our only solution going forward? Um, I didn't really look into the, like, more innovative ways of doing this. But I know there's defi definitely like a lot of options and a lot of ways to look through the, or like dispose of these sediments. So I mentioned at the beginning that like only non-toxic sediments can be disposed of at this ocean disposal site. And there's also like other options like 
beach nourishment. So if like the, the sediment meets like a certain grain size, it can be disposed of on, on the beach to restore beaches. And then also if it's, if it's like especially contaminated, there's like a, a confined aquatic disposal. So they actually will dredge an area, put the sediment in there and then cap it. So that's an option for like really contaminated sediments. And Newport Bay did actually have an option to use a landfill, but that was revoked or it's not in use anymore. So they have to like come up with new ways of disposing of this. Yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, can you tell us what some of the different forms of mercury are and why some forms are more toxic than others? Yeah, I can. I actually have a slide on this. <laughs> oh, what a coincidence. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> All right. So there's actually main, there's four main forms of mercury. There's elemental, divalent, monomethyl, and dimethyl mercury. And the chemical makeup actually determines its toxicity in the marine environment. So elemental is actually the least toxic. However, more organic forms such as um, monomethyl, divalent, and dimethyl are more toxic. And dimethyl is actually considered the most toxic form of mercury, but its levels are very low in the environment due to its volatility. So monomethyl mercury is actually the most present form of mercury. Um, and then what makes monomethyl mercury so toxic is that it can actually bind to amino, an amino acid where it's recognized as another amino acid in the body and then it can cross the blood brain barrier and it strongly binds to proteins so it's not readily eliminated as well from the body and it can bioaccumulate like I talked about earlier. Um, so I know you, you have uh, folks from the EPA on your capstone committee. Can you tell us a little bit about how the EPA monitors and manages the disposal site that you were studying mm -hmm. of Newport? Yeah, so I have a, a map here. Um, so currently the LA3 site monitoring includes mapping of the sediment characteristics on the seafloor and then characterizing physical changes in assessing the benthic habitat. So the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers actually jointly develop these site management and monitoring plans for each disposal site, and those must meet specific attributes according to the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. Um, and there's like a whole extensive list of attributes included that each, dis each disposal site must have. So there's like, for example, baseline assessment of the conditions, a program for monitoring of the site, special management conditions or practices to be implemented. Um, and then they must review and revise the plan at least every 10 years. Um, so the ocean dumping management program through the EPA also conducts oceanographic surveys at these disposal sites. Um, and they use these surveys to evaluate the physical, chemical and biological conditions and then confirm site conditions that are consistent with predisposal. Um, and then they determine if any management actions may be needed based on these surveys. So if we take a look at the map here, this is actually a survey done in 2015 for the LA3 ocean disposal site, where the green circle indicates the LA3 site and the blue square is actually the survey area. So samples are actually collected in like a radial pattern inside and outside of the disposal site. And these values are compared to a reference side circled here um, that actually has similar biogeochemical influences to the disposal site. Yeah.